Okay. That's the best way to do it. I haven't decided what I'm doing. Jill and I have to talk about it. I have pretty simple tastes. I think I'm asking for meatloaf. <laughs> well, I like filet mignon, but I'm cheap. So meatloaf and mashed potatoes gets me by. Yeah. yeah. Right? Corn, corn and green beans, if I'm lucky. All right, looks like we are online now. Okay, hello. Yeah. I like, they make a version of that. They sell at Walmart that's gluten-free. It's the Great Value brand. Um, they call it beef stroganoff, but it's basically hamburger helper. And that's pretty good. Yeah, we have all the choices of the different Yeah, yeah. It is good stuff. Okay, let's get to praying here. Who has prayer requests? We can pray for Anna starting school tomorrow, right? She's very excited. Yeah, that can make you pretty sick. Right. Well, thank you. I'll keep praying for that. Yeah. Charlie, do you have any prayer requests you'd like to lift up? Mom. Yeah. We prayed for her this morning in Sunday school. Miss Darlene, I got your unspoken. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Okay. Yeah, we're, J Josiah is learning too right now. He leaves some mohawks in the grass, but yeah. Yeah. It is. It's all part of it. Well, what we've been doing is I do the front yard and he does the backyard. So that's his practice area. Uh, my mom is on with us. Hi, mom. Uh, Jim and Carol Isaac are on with us. They asked for prayers for recovery from them. Um, Carol brought back a cold from the hospital, and now Jim has it too. So they've been out of gas lately. Um, couple for the church. Um, please keep Eric in your prayers. He had to go back to the hospital this week. Um, you guys might remember he's had some issues with some veins in his throat bleeding a little bit. He had two more spots that started bleeding. They had to go in and cauterize. So it, the procedure was all done. He was just waiting to get the clear to come home when I talked to him this morning. So hopefully he made it home before the rain. But he was insistent that he drive himself. So, <laughs> so I said, okay. Um, please pray for Rich. He's dealing with some dental issues that are causing a lot of jaw pain. And that is a miserable thing. We have a praise. We were praying for Charlene. Uh, she had some kidney stone pain last week that has gone away. So I guess they're thinking maybe she has a little stone that's moving around a little bit or something. Because she had a stone, was it two years ago she passed a couple stones? I think it was two years. But keep her in your prayers, please. Um, Daryl's daughter Rachel had her wedding shower today. So Rachel and Joseph are getting married later this year. And of course, Annalise and Josh are also getting married later this year. So they got two weddings in the same year. So lots of, uh, lots of cake in the future for them. 
Yeah, well, that's how it rolls, right? Um, Daryl would like us to keep praying for his brother, Rich. He had to have surgery on his foot for an infection. And uh, we're just praying. They had to take part of one of his toes. So we're praying that everything heals and they don't have to take any more. Um, Diane gave us a praise. We've been praying for her co-worker's daughter, Carly. She's the one who had injured her knees and then went in with uh, pulmonary embolism. She is home. They think they got all the clots broken up and she didn't have any more problems. She's in her 30s, so not old. Um, but then her, co Carly's cousin, his name is Travis, had an accident with fireworks and he lost three fingers and his left eye. Yeah. So that's a very debilitating injury. Um, I know, now that they're legal, they're everywhere. They're at the grocery store. Um, Josiah's hand is healing well. He's got nine stitches in his finger right now. Yes, well, he was not playing. He was splitting kindling. And you know how it goes. He went to get the hatchet set in the wood and had his hand on it. And I told, I was telling him not to do it that way. But so we all learn. I got him. We'll have matching scars now. So. Yeah. Well, we cut a corner off his finger. Um, I'm not sure if I mentioned this when the camera was on or not, but Marty is doing well down in Delaware at um, Coral Gardens, Coral Springs, Coral Springs. So keep him in your prayers as he's recovering. Venus asked us to please pray for a situation at work. She'd also like us to continue praying for Cheryl and Janet. They're both recovering from surgeries. Um, that's a no, Jim. So uh, we need to pray for our brother Rob. We haven't seen him in a little while and we haven't been able to get a hold of him. Um, and then some others from church. Of course, Charlie already mentioned Faye, but we need to keep Tony and Wilma in our prayers and also Charles and Donna. So that's most of my list. Is there anything that you guys can think of that we need to add in? It depends on which bid we go with. The number we've been using right now is 26. That's the more expensive one as well. It's more expensive to install, but it is more efficient, and it comes with parts and labor warranty. So we have 20 that is designated for the freezer, and we have about six that's in the general operator. So we can use the general operating fund on for the freezer, but we, we can't really wipe the bank account down to zero. So we need to get at least a couple more thousand in the bank. So we're, we're right on the edge. I don't think so, no. No, I think we're still in the window to have another one. Back to school breakfast is a very good one. That's true. Well, one of the good things is if we get the walk in freezer, we have two units that are convertible that we just put to a freezer. So if we can get the extra freezer, we can push them over the fridge and then we'll run the unit. So it will, it will do a world of good for us. So yeah, the one, I mean, the board has a meeting in a week and a half, and I think we're going to make this decision more than that. Yeah. Well, I, I think the installed one is going to be a little bit more expensive up front. So we're looking at either one that's built in place or one uh, refrigerated shipping container. Um, the, the plus side of the shipping container is it can be moved. 
So if you need to move it somewhere else on the property, or you, or you can even sell it. But they're less efficient. And you're just buying it as is. Even though it's new, it's not, it's not coming with any kind of warranty. The one that gets built in place, the guy who installs it, he does a one-year labor guarantee as well as the parking. Yeah. And he'll also come back to help make sure it's set up. He'll come in and check on the temperatures and the ice and the drain. And so I think it's worth spending a little more money in the beginning yeah. to get the better product. Yeah. Do you need a kitchen? No, it's going to be outside. Outside. Yeah, we're, it's going to be on like 10 by 20 probably. Yeah, we're probably going to put it right by the doors that go straight out. The doors that go out of the gym. Over here? On the far end. The doors that go out straight this way. You know the two double doors? Yeah, yeah. the one that has the buttons on the wall. Yeah, it'll be right by that door, so that way we can still back. So the, the truck that delivers through to us, they use a lift gate and a pallet jack. So that way, if we have it there opening onto the asphalt, we can have pallets wheeled right from the truck into the street. Cool. You want to put a there? We can actually put it on the, on the asphalt there, on the side. So we'll lose a parking spot or two, but it'll save the money of having to pour the concrete. No void park underneath those windows along. Exactly. Oh, I was told that they can't hear me when I walk away. I'm sorry. So I'm back up here. We got it working. Um, it looks like it actually shut off for a second. Just as a warning for people online, we're, you probably know, but we're getting heavy rain, and when we get rain, the Internet connection cuts in and out sometimes. So it dipped out for a second, and we're back up. Yeah. I don't know if it's where the wire comes into the building or what, but it happens it happens across the street to the McGowan's too, so it's just how it is. Yep. Yep. All right, well let's pray and then we can um let it is. I don't think we're high on the priority, but we'll see. Let's get to praying, and then we can get to John 14. We might even finish the chapter tonight. I don't know. We'll see. Oh, Jane's on with us, too. Hello, Miss Jane. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you for this night. Thank you that we got here safely. And uh, we pray for uh, protection from any flooding, that anybody out on the road is safe. And uh, we thank you that we can come together online, too, for people who can't make it out. Father, we lift up our brother Eric. We thank you that he's doing all right. And we pray for his full recovery from his procedure. Thank you that they caught that bleed early and were able to get everything taken care of. We lift up our brother Rich, Father. We pray that you will be with him as he's dealing with this jaw pain and that you will help bring relief, that you'll help him to get some rest and to sleep. We thank you, Father, that Charlene's kidney pain is gone and we pray that um, it'll stay that way. We know this is a chronic issue, but we pray, Father, that you'll just keep watch over her and protect her. We lift up uh, Rachel and Joseph as they have their bridal shower today. Thank you for the gift of love and marriage and weddings. And we also want to lift up Annalise and Josh as they're planning their wedding, too. Um, it's a busy summer for Daryl and Charlene, but thank you for these wonderful things that we get to celebrate. Um, we lift up Daryl's brother, Rich, Father. We pray for his foot, that the infection would clear, and that he would not need further surgery. Um, we lift up Carly to you, Father. We thank you that the blood clot in her lung dissolved and there's no further trouble. She's home. Thank you so much, Father. We also lift up Carly's cousin, Travis, who had the accident with the fireworks. Um, we pray, Father, for the injury to his eye and his hand. We also lift up Josiah, Father. Thank you that he's healing well. We ask for prayers for our brother Rob. We miss him, and we're not sure where he's at or what's going on, and so we pray that you would please be with him. Thank you, Father, that Marty's recovering well, and we pray for 
um, stability as he walks around, and we thank you that they were able to put in a stent and help his heart. We lift up Venus to you, Father. We pray for her work situation. And uh, we also lift up Cheryl and Janet as they recover from their surgeries. We want to remember Tony and Wilma and Charles and Donna. Father, we remember Faye along with her family. Um, we pray that you'll be present with them as they're making some choices right now. Father, we celebrate with Anna as she's starting school tomorrow. We're glad that she's so excited, and we pray that she'll get to keep learning and have a positive environment. Um, I pray for the first day jitters. We know it's a new school, so pray that everything goes smoothly. We also lift up Gina's friends, the, the husband with cancer and his wife and their family. Um, as he's finishing radiation and starting chemo, Father, we pray that you will be present with him through this treatment. We know how hard this is physically, but also spiritually and emotionally, how stressful this is for a stage four cancer diagnosis. Father, we lift up Darlene's Unspokens. We thank you that the boys are here tonight, and um, we pray for, um, well, we pray for her Unspokens, Father. We lift up Jim and Carol. We thank you that um, they are resting and healing and that they have Nurse Sasha to take care of them and uh, that they could join us online. Please be with us tonight, Father, as we study your word, um, as we're working in this gospel, Father, especially this time between um, the Last Supper and the Crucifixion. It's such a powerful time, and we pray, Father, that you would be with us as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Peekaboo. Pika Frank. Yep. All right. All right. So I bet you had a fun drive, huh? Oh, it was a fun drive. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you made it safely. I keep, you know, that song. Um, that, it tapered off here. here, here yeah, well, about 530, the, the, the whole road was flooded and it was rough. So, thankfully, it's tapering off. I'm glad you survived. Life jackets are on the port side. <laughs> yeah. The um, problem that is, uh, the ship is lifting 45 minutes. We're listing the star. Yeah. Well, thankfully, we are not the, uh, we're not the Titanic. Yeah, I was thinking about the, uh, the one that Oh, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. All right, so we are in John chapter 14. Um, I'm going to give my disclaimer that I kind of gave last week, too. Um, John, in general, is, is kind of a dense gospel because a lot of the imagery. This section in particular, from the foot washing through um, the crucifixion, there's a lot here. So we've spent two weeks already in John chapter 14. I think we'll be finishing the chapter tonight. We're picking up at verse 15. John chapter 14, we're picking up at verse 15. And I just want to mention for a moment, you know, we're in the middle of a conversation here. So we've had the foot washing and the supper, and now there's conversation between Jesus and the disciples. And Jesus is trying to really get them to understand what's about to happen um, and, and that's part of the point here at the end of this chapter that um, he's telling them when this all happens, you'll understand, basically. They've heard in their minds what's going to happen, but until they've seen him die and rise again, it's, it's not quite going to sink in. So um, we're going to have Judas is going to jump into the conversation tonight, which is interesting. But if uh, we could have a volunteer to read John chapter 14, verses 15 through 21, that would help us out a lot. <laughs> I know they could hear you on Facebook, but Pastor Karen just looked down at her Bible and said, it's in Greek. <laughs> and uh, that makes me smile. So uh, actually, you can help us out when we get to... Um, there's a verse where I want to get your help for. Okay. Um, but we can have somebody else start out. All right. If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you and he will be in you. I will not leave you open by a in a little while, the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Because I live, you 
Thank you very much. So we read this at the end of last week's lesson, because it's, a, like I said, this is some dense stuff. This is, uh, you know, this isn't whipped cream. This is fruitcake, right? So it takes some time and a cup of tea to get through this. So let's start there with verse 15. If you love me, obey my commandments. Now, some translations might have a different word there for obey. Does anyone's Bible have a, a word other than obey there in verse 15? Keep, keep right. Um, I think keep is probably a better way to say it, although with the language of commandments, I understand why a lot of translations use obey because obeying a commandment. But remember, when we're talking about commandments, we're not just talking about following the speed limit, right? We're talking about a covenantal relationship. So maybe we could, ins we could switch out keep for obey, but maybe even put in vow for commandment, right? I know we're playing a little with the language here, but keeping a vow, I think, gets a little closer to the heart of this, right? Yeah. Um, and there is a word for obey. This is not the word for obey. Right. It's just right. So um, if you're like me and don't speak Greek, you cheat, right? Mm -hmm. So I. Yes. Yeah, so I use um, Bible study software that has what I affectionately call the Greek donut. And what it gives me is a pie chart, and it tells you the Greek word, and it shows you how that word is translated in different places. And you can see that this word is not usually translated as obey, right? Um, it's particularly touchy in the Gospel of John, because one of our themes that we've been talking about is the difference between head knowledge and faith, right? How there are people who they have the head knowledge that Jesus can perform signs, but it hasn't trans trickled down into the faith part, right? And this whole section here, really, um, it's about the promise of the Holy Spirit, but the meat of it is you're about to go through something extremely difficult, and they're going to need help to get through it. And Jesus runs the whole gamut. Before the end of this chapter, we're not just talking about his death and resurrection. We're also talking about his ascension, right? So a word that gets used commonly now in, in our languages is being triggered, right? So imagine you just watch Jesus die, and then he rises again, and then you lose him again. It's going to push on that same wound, right? Or maybe poke at those same fears. So... Why do you think Jesus would be talking about keeping his commands or keeping his teachings? Yeah. 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 They they've got to be ready to take over the family business. Right? right now, dad's there to answer your questions when you don't know, you know how to build the house. But when dad leaves, you've got to know how to run the business. Yeah. I know that's a little bit of a rough analogy, but that's kind of what we're talking about, right? Um, okay, so why do you think he's tying love in? I mean, you can obey someone without loving them, right? Why do you think love is tied in here? Can you think of one of the groups of people that Jesus often disagreed with in the Bible? Yeah, yeah they were really good at obeying, right? The fair, that was their thing. They knew all the laws and they obeyed all the laws. But their hearts weren't, right? So this is kind of a callback to some of these themes, and you're going to see that. that As we go through this section and, and through Jesus' prayer, too, in, in a couple chapters, He's saying words and phrases that are meant to connect back to issues that we've talked about earlier in, in the gospel. So love, of course, is one of the very important themes of the gospel of John, along with faith. So, if you love me, keep my ways. Right? And 
Jesus makes a promise. What will he do? Okay, so some translations say advocate. You might actually have heard this Greek word. The word is paraclete, right? So this is a word that is used in other places as well to refer to the Holy Spirit. Um, how would you translate paraclete, Pastor? Helper. Helper? Yeah. Yeah, I think helpmate, helper. Some, some people use the word encourager, but it's, it's one of those words that's so much deeper than helper, right? Um, one who's called aside to help. So they're right there with you. Right. So, and in you. This is in you. Right. This is even better. Yeah. Which we dig into that really in, in the prayer that, that, that we will be one as the Trinity is one. Right? So um, advocate I do think is an interesting English word to use. Um, in English, what, the, what does an advocate usually do? It's a courtroom situation where the advocate is someone who uh, protects the court hearing, how it goes for the uh, plaintiff. Yeah, so like in, in, in the defendant, yeah. So like in the military, you ever heard of the JAG Corps, the Judge Advocate General? But it goes deeper than that too, like in our healthcare system, if you have someone who is not capable of making their own medical choices, they can be assigned an advocate from the state who will watch over them and help make their choices and decisions. So there's the legal side, there's also the care side. There's the I'm on, I'm supporting you, but also I'm giving you help that you need that you can't, I'm helping you meet needs that you can't meet on your own. Yeah, guardian could be a word too, yeah, yeah. So we're getting into like some kind of parental territory, but also alongside. So it's really deep, a deep emotional word, right? Important to say that a person that speaks and another person is saying. And then another thing is another name for the Holy Spirit. Right. Yeah. To speak in our defense. And of course, the, the part after Paraclete. Who will never leave you. Right? Who will never leave you. Why do you think that would be important to hear? Because you already feel abandoned. You're going to feel abandoned too. Because you please. And now Jesus is affirming the helper. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think there's an extra deep layer for some of the Jewish followers. You guys ever heard the phrase intertestamental period? So this is the time in history that is between Malachi and the Gospels, okay? And that was roughly 400 years. So the Jewish people had gone about 400 years without a prophet. And then they get John the Baptist and Jesus. So to go 400 years with no, I mean, think about, I mean, what, what was our country 400 years ago? 400 years ago, we weren't a country. Right? 400 years ago was 1623. There were like three pilgrims on a rock shivering. <laughs> yeah. So 400 years is a long time in history, in human terms, right? So to go 400 years without a prophet and then to see your prophet die and ascend, well, that could be scary. You know, when. Elijah ascended in the fiery chariot, he left behind Elisha. So we still had another guy. He was bald, but he was good, right? <laughs> in this case, when Jesus ascends, he's leaving the Holy Spirit who will never leave. And we'll talk about this a little more too as we go through the post-resurrection period, but this is really important for us the way we think. This is starting a new phase in history. Anybody here study history? How do we work dates in history? There's a big divide in there, right? Please. Well, right, right now we're using the common era. Right. But so before we were politically correct, yeah. Yeah. Politically correct, it used to be in the year of our Lord. Before Christ. Before Christ. Yeah. Or after Christ. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're Muslim, they go before the jihad or after the jihad. 
Right. Yeah. Well, we see this change as history, right? Even people who don't believe understand that the world changed at this time. And of course, the, 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 the incarnation, the death, resurrection, but also the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, right? We, we can't downplay the effect that Pentecost has on the world. Um, and you see that in the lives of the disciples, especially if you go into the book of Acts. But this changes the world. And we're still in that age, right? We are still in that same phase of history where we are after the resurrection, after Pentecost, but before the trumpets have sounded, right? So we're in, we're in this phase that is what some people call the now and the not yet, right? The first fruit has been harvested. Jesus has been resurrected, amen? Right? And we have hope that we'll be resurrected like he, he was. But the cake's not done baking yet. So there, we still live in a fallen world. You know, we still have an enemy, an accuser, who's out there trying to get us. And uh, we are still waiting for the final restoration of all things. And so Jesus is saying, when you get into this phase, you will need a paraclete. You can't get through, you will not stand faithful to the end without the paraclete. Okay, so... The paraclete, the Holy Spirit, will lead us somewhere. Verse 17, where will the paraclete lead us? Into truth. Into the truth. The spirit of truth. But it's, it's the truth as it is in Jesus. It's the truth. Yeah. It's according to the Bible. It's the truth. Yeah. And why is that so important? The rest of the world is a lie. The rest of the world is a lie. That's a very good way to put it. So we, we might think of deconstruction as a, a new thing with post-modernity, post but deconstruction was going on all the way back into Greek and Roman philosophy, right? Tearing down belief structures and questioning truth and reality. Um, you know, people like Socrates and Aristotle and all the way through Descartes and you know, people have been picking at this thing. What does it really mean? What is, what is the physical world? Is there anything beyond the physical? And if you put 10 people in a room, you get 14 answers, right? That's how it was then. A lot of the New Testament, you know, um, like 1st and 2nd John, or 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, or 1st and 2nd Peter, the, these letters are written, and, and even the Gospel of John, too, are speaking into heresy. They're trying to correct beliefs that are already going off the rails, right? Even before the New Testament was finished being written, before the Gospel of John was finished, you already had people teaching false things, right? You had people like Simon the Magician, who were like, man, I want some of this power, and I'm going to do what i got to do to get it, right? Um, and how much does it cost? Right, how much, what do i got to give you? How much does it cost? Right? Because that's how most people think, right? Yeah. So I know it works a little faster now that we have the internet, but really that problem has been around all through history. Really all the way back to the serpent, right? This question of what is truth? And we're going to bring in, last week we talked about a phrase that Jesus used where he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? So we're not just talking about truth as an idea. We're also talking about truth embodied in Christ. And so when the Holy Spirit leads us into truth, we're not just talking about getting good answers on our SATs. If Jesus is the truth and the Holy Spirit leads us into truth, who does the Holy Spirit lead us into? Jesus, right? So these are dots we're meant to connect. I know it's taken us a little bit of time to read through chapter 14, but this is all the same conversation for Jesus, right? It, this was just a few minutes ago in his conversation that he said, I am the truth. So now the Holy Spirit leading into truth, we're meant to connect these dots, right? So we're not going to have Jesus walking around Galilee feeding people. We're going to have the paraclete in our heart leading us into truth, which is not just about right thinking. It's also our heart 
and abiding and, and that whole idea of being in, in right relationship and in life. Now, another important thing. Who receives the Holy Spirit? Believers. Believers. Okay. Now, there's one slight caveat I want to talk about. Okay. So, we believe in, in, the, in the Church of the Nazarene, we are, if you, if you kind of branch the family trees of theology, we're on the Wesleyan holiness side of the family tree. And we believe in this concept called prevenient grace, which is that God reaches out to us before. Okay? That's not what we're talking about here. Right? We're not talking about, behold, I stand at the door and knock. We're talking about fully receiving the Holy Spirit. Okay. Um, God loves every person, every, every, every one of Adam's race, right? Um, but without believing, you cannot fully receive the Holy Spirit. Okay. And so this idea of it trying to explain what it is to someone who hasn't received it, it's, I mean, think about this. Think about when you were a child learning what love was before you had ever felt it. Right? It's kind of hard to explain what love is if you've never felt it. You can use analogies and words and poetry and, and songs and all kinds of things, art, but until you felt it, you don't really know. So Jesus is saying, this paraclete is a gift for believers. And it's not that we're special or that we earned it. It's just that we're the ones that accepted the gift. To use this morning's language, right? We have accepted the gift and can receive it. The big thing is, the world is not looking for the Holy Spirit and doesn't recognize the Holy Spirit. Okay? The world is so busy looking at its distractions and its sin that it's not paying attention for God. Sin's not bad, it's fun. And God doesn't want you to have fun. Right? Along those kind of lines. Yeah, exactly. And kind of where I started to go and I got sidetracked. You know, with Adam and Eve and the serpent, there's the information God gave them. Eat this, don't eat that. Right? But deeper than the information was remaining in right relationship with God. Meaning, knowing where God and I stand. Okay? There's a book that I'm reading that is teaching me lots. A little bit of Hebrew, but some good ideas. The book is called A Church Called Tob. T-O-B. So, yeah, so, so Tob and Ra are basically the words that we translate as good and evil. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's way deeper than good and evil. It's like wholeness and chaos, right? But it was God's place to decide what is Tob and what is Ra. What is good and what is not good. Tov is good. And Adam and Eve decided to take it, that power into their hands to decide what is Tov. And they tried to make something Tov that is not Tov. They did something that God told them was destructive, thinking that it was appealing, and it led to destruction. Right? They were manipulated by, by the serpent, but they also made the choice. And they were not ignorant. You know, they knew what God said. Eve repeats back. She, she was not ignorant. Um, that's one of the significant roles of the Holy Spirit, to give us um, discernment, right? Because there are going to be times where people try to teach us things and say, this is really what the Bible says, or this is really what God wants. And we're going to have to figure out if that's true or not, Right? And there have been some times in church history, even relatively recently, that we have made mistakes. Think about in the history of our country, how um, people tried to use the Bible to justify slavery and segregation, right? Yeah, so you know, if you've heard of the Jefferson Bible, he took a pair of scissors and he cut out anywhere there was a miracle. So he probably wasn't left with much. In the beginning, I don't know what else there is. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, he cut out all the places where there were miracles. Oh, in the New Testament. Yeah, sorry, yes, sorry. In the New Testament, yeah. Um, 
So we need the Holy Spirit to give us that source of tov and to know Jesus. Um, so the world cannot receive him. Now, even though they haven't fully received him, there's this really interesting thing here in verse 17. You know him because he lives with you now and later will be in you. What do you think the difference is between the paraclete being with you and the paraclete being in you? When Mo sorry, the changes in nature. Our nature changes when we become a Christian. When we receive the Holy Spirit that's in us. And our nature changes. We reflect the is the, reflecting the image and likeness of God. Yeah. I forget which is which. Theologically the difference, but I forget. Yeah. yeah, I mean this is sanctification to use maybe our church language. And it's plural, because it's community. Yes, that you is plural. Maybe it's plural. Yep. That's a very good point, Pastor, that this is not I know we think of it a lot in individual terms. Are you saved? Have you received the Holy Spirit? This person isn't saved. This person's sanctified. We, we break it down into individual terms, but this was not something that was meant to be individual. This is meant to be communal, right? Just like the people of Israel. This was meant to be us together as a people. In the Acts church. Right. So I, we're not going to read all of Acts tonight, but... The book of Acts is the perfect example of what happens when bodies of believers encounter the Holy Spirit, not just with, but in, and how their lives are changed. Peter himself is a wonderful example. You see a marked difference in the way Peter behaves before Pentecost than after. Right? Yeah. It gets on in there. <laughs> and... There's a very important phrase here that I think we need to pay attention to. It says, I will not abandon you as orphans. Right? I will not abandon you as orphans. There's a, a portion of the prophet Hosea where God speaks about Israel as uh, foundling as an orphan that was taken in and raised and cared for, who later rejected him. This image of God as an adoptive, caring parent, bringing in a wayward child and raising them up and protecting them and teaching them. That's in Hosea. Thank you. Yeah, in the prophet Hosea. Um, God speaks to Hosea, but he says, oh Israel, I, I found you and I cleaned you up because you're a dirty little kid and I gathered you in and I fed you and I taught you and you walked and you, you know. Um, God's saying, it's going to look like things went sideways. It's going to look like the plan didn't work. And the accuser is going to use those events to try to convince you that, that it was all a lie. But you will not be left as orphans. You will never be left as well. Yeah, the Greek is, I will not leave. Right. So, even though Jesus is ascending into heaven, Jesus is a member of the Trinity. And I know sometimes, and I know I do it too, we use language like, like Jesus coming back, like he's gone, right? Um, maybe we'll use some language Jesus himself used. He says... He said earlier in this gospel that when we've seen him, we've seen the Father, right? Does that also apply to the Spirit? Yeah. When we encounter one part of the Trinity, we're encountering the Trinity. So even though it's going to change a little bit, it's not going to be exactly like it was. Right? He's not going to be giving them nogis and cooking their breakfast. This is even better. And it might not seem better at first because it's different. And we don't usually do well with different. But think about scaling up, right? How many disciples did Jesus really have? We'll use the easy number, 12, right? Now, one fell away, right? Of that 12, there were three that were super close to him, Peter, James, and John. That's not that many. It's not that many people, right? How many people have received the Holy Spirit? Billions. Right? So 
sometimes I think, man, wouldn't it be nice to just be walking around with Jesus? Well, that's true. But in order for this message to go from a family in, in the Middle East to the world, this is part of God's plan for the spirit to spread. I will not abandon you as orphans. Soon the world will no longer see me, but you will see me. Since I live, you will live. What do you think he means when he says the world will no longer see me? Well, he's going to die, so he's going to be gone for a little bit then. And then he's going to pop back in. Yeah. So the world's not going to be like, hey, where's that Jesus guy? He ain't around anymore. But does that mean he's really gone? I mean, there's one instance that happens right away when Paul has a vision and encounters Jesus, right? And Paul even says in his epistles, I saw the Lord. Mm-hmm. But wait, Jesus ascended before Paul got, how did, right? Because we're talking about God here, right? And little did they know. <laughs> Yeah. I missed the comment here. I just want to refer back to when we were talking about love. Jim said, because love is what it's all about. Man, that's a way to sum it up. Um, When I'm raised to life again, you will know that I'm in my Father and you are in me and I'm in you. Jesus has said this to them multiple times. But seeing is believing sometimes, right? Yeah. One of the themes of the Gospel of John, remember, is signs and wonders. And signs point to something. So his resurrection is the final sign that really drives it home for them. That everything that he has said is true. When he dies and is buried, they're going to question and think, maybe everything he said was wrong. Right? But then when he rises again, oh no, it's all right. He says, when I am raised, you will know. When they see, they will know. Now, 21. Those who accept my commandments and obey them are the ones who love me. It sounds a little bit like we're repeating verse 15, right? Yeah. Except, now we've got a couple layers in. And because they love me, my Father will love them and I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Before the Gospels, how did you become loved by Yahweh? The main way. Before the Gospels, in the Old Testament, how did a person become loved by Yahweh or become a child of God? Well, it got a little more technical. You had to be born into it, right? To be a full member. You need a Jewish mother. Yeah. It was a bloodline. Yeah. So before this, in order to be a legitimate child, we'll use that because we're talking about orphans and adoption, right? In order to be considered a legitimate child of God, you had to trace your blood back to Abraham. And not just Abraham, but also down through Isaac, right? Because there were other offspring. You had to go through the right line, right? Um, But Jesus is saying, no, it's not about who your parents are or what your genetics are or what the family tree says. It's about love. If you love Jesus and stay true to him, You will be loved by God. And loved by Jesus. You'll be full of the Spirit. And Jesus will reveal himself to each of them. So we can use the language of Spirit and Truth. We can use the language of Son. We can use the language of Father and Adopting. You can use all three parts of the Trinity to explain this. But basically we're saying there was the old way. Because in the old way, there was such a thing as a proselyte or or a convert to Judaism. But if you were a proselyte, there were still limits. You were in, but you weren't really in. You weren't both Right. You were still kind of the, the, the black sheep. Right? But 
Jesus is saying that's not how this is. If you love and obey, you're in. And when you're in, you get full rights and privileges. Okay? There's a, a little snippet in, in Exodus where it's describing Moses going into the tabernacle praying with God. And it says they spoke to one another as friends. Okay? I bet there were a lot of people who longed to have what Moses guess what happens when you're filled with the Holy Spirit? We get to have that. Right? So the, this closeness with God that was reserved to certain people at certain times is now available to the whole world. And as we'll see later, not, not just men, not just women, not just free, not just slave, everybody. Right? It's all about love. Um, there's an, another thing I kind of skipped this part so I'll backtrack just a little bit why is it so important and we kind of got this in the beginning I'm, we're circling back why is it so important that they accept and obey what Jesus has taught They are disciples, but very soon they're going to be making disciples. Right? So if they don't have the right knowledge and the right heart, they're not going to be able to do that. Does that connect to where we are in history? Are we supposed to be disciples? Are we supposed to make disciples? Yeah. How do we do that? If you love me, abide. Right? Yeah. What happens when we don't do that? How many times have you heard somebody say, or nowadays seen on social media, well, that guy said he's a Christian, and look what he did. So I don't want anything to do with that. Yeah. You hear it a lot. That's probably a good thing, honey. <laughs> That's a good point. If you give up something for Lent and it helps, don't take it back. Okay, sorry. But yeah. Yeah, some people say it's just confirmation bias. You know? So uh, confirmation bias is a logical fallacy. It's a, a bad way of thinking where basically you only point out evidence that supports your claim. Right? So like I have a friend who says that seatbelts actually make things more dangerous than a crash. Because they were in a car crash and they weren't wearing a seatbelt and they survived. Yeah, so they say that proves that you shouldn't wear a seatbelt. That's confirmation bias. That's what they already believe, and so they're holding on to the evidence that proves the other. Right. Now, if we were just talking about one person, that could be true, right? But when it comes to these people, they can't hear me when I'm here, sorry. Um, are we just talking about one person? No. A great cloud of witnesses, right? Yeah. I mean, when you look at history, the fact that this happened 2,000 years ago, and so many people still today are still talking about it. Man, Jesus changed my life. Coming to know God changed my life. I've probably told you this before, but somebody stopped me a couple years ago. I was in the hospital walking with my Bible. It was actually this Bible. And they said, is that a Bible? And I said, yep. And he said, do you read that? Do you really read it? And I was like, well, look at the cover. I was like, yeah, of course I read it. And he's like, why? He said, that's just, that's just a book written by people. 
And I said, well, I understand why you could think that, but why I read it is because I read it and it changed my life. And I keep reading it and it keeps helping me. And that's it, right? Psalm 34, so you can see that the Lord is good. He went and walked away. <laughs> I didn't get the answer he wanted. Not that time, no. I've had more conversations with that person lately. That's kind of the point of this, right? Like the Romans and the guards. And if it was one guy saying that one body, if it was a weekend at Bernie's thing where they pulled the body, and like, hey, look, he's alive! You know? Um, that would be one thing. But when you're talking about hundreds of millions or billions at this point, I don't even know the right numbers, billions of people who have given their life to Christ, received the Holy Spirit, and been changed. Yeah. Hard to argue with those kind of numbers. Um, another way that Jesus explains it, not in John, but in, in Matthew and Luke, he says, you'll know a tree by its fruit. Mm -hmm. right? So when I look at these other religions and I see the fruit that is produced, it's different than Christianity. But it's also why it's so important for genuine believers to stand up against heresy. So, for instance, right now in our country, there is a large movement that's gaining steam of white Christian nationalism. Okay? That is heretical and destructive. Mm -hmm. But there are some people who've never encountered Jesus who think that's Jesus. Yeah. Right? And it's important for us to say, no, that's not the truth. That's a lie. And to be done in such a way that they'll know by our love, by our unity, like we talked about this morning, that what we're saying is different. And it has to be that way. Because empire, whether it was Nebuchadnezzar or Pilate or Caligula, right? Empire always uses force to make people come into line. But if you're only coming into line because of force, what happens when you let go of that force? You, right, you, you're only going to listen when somebody's standing over you with a stick. That's why this is about love. How Jim said that love is what it's all about. Jesus is saying, when you encounter him and abide in him, this is not about following rules. Right? This is about your life being healed. And we're, going to get it. we're not going to get to it tonight, apparently, because it may take too long. But towards the end of this chapter, Jesus talks about peace. Right? And how we'll receive peace. And that it's something that the world cannot give us. It's not in the same order. Right. It's it nothing the like. Peace. The best the world can offer us is a momentary pause from conflict. Getting back to the Hebrew again. Shalom means salvation and good health. Yeah. And everything right in your life. Yeah, and shalom. People, shalom. Right. Yeah. It's not just peace. It's, it requires all these other words in English. It's, it's not just a word, it's a concept. Well, that's something that God made you to do. And when you are living the way God made you to live, it feels right. right. The Holy Spirit's in your heart going, Yeah, Darlene, this is what you were made for. Help people. <laughs> I know I know and that's what Jesus is saying right you will see you will see me you will know me right when you're worshiping and you're packing boxes and you're helping people and your back is hurting and you are smiling you're doing what you were made to do you're, you're fulfilling your purpose yeah um I think we have time for this next part. Can somebody read verses 22 to 26? I'll tell you what, I'll take a turn. Judas, not Judas Iscariot, but the other disciple with that name. <laughs> this is important, right? Because there's weight there. Lord, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not to the world at large? Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. 
my Father will love them, and we will come and make our home with each of them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey me. And remember, my words are not my own. What I am telling you is from the Father who sent me. I'm telling you these things now while I am still with you. But when the Father sends the paraclete as my representative, that is the Holy Spirit, he will teach you everything and will remind you of everything I have told you. So, this, these questions are kind of pointing back to some ideas we've already started to poke at and talk about, right? Um, Judas says, why are you going to reveal yourself only to us and not the world at large? But didn't Jesus just say that anybody who accepts him, and who, they're still not getting it, right? They're still thinking people of Israel, chosen people, group of disciples. They're still thinking us and them not we, right? So Judas asks a clear question. Um, why are you going to reveal yourself to us and not the whole world? Um, does Jesus answer the question? <laughs> in a roundabout way. Yeah, in a, like teachers do, right? Mm -hmm. he, does, you know, he doesn't just give you the treat, he makes you work for it a little bit. All who love me will do what I say. He's kind of already said that, right? He's restating the point because he wants to see, listen, if you connect the dots the proper way, I already answered this question. You just didn't see it yet. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. Judas was just saying, us, right? You're going to reveal yourself only to us. But what did Jesus just say? Them. Now I know pronouns are different in different languages, but that's an important change, right? Mm -hmm. It's going from yeah. exclusive to inclusive. Yeah. Now us, them, the world. Anyone who does not love me will not obey me. And we kind of get that, right? That there are going to be people who don't love, who don't listen, who don't obey. Um, my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. Mm. I'm telling you these things now while I'm with you, but when the Father sends the Advocate, that is the Holy Spirit, He'll teach you everything and will remind you of everything I told you. Does He come out and say, does He repeat the Great Commission here, let's say? He doesn't, does He? No. He doesn't state it like that. I wonder why. Well, I, I've got an idea. Jesus is looking for so much more. I mean, this isn't multi-level marketing, right? He's not saying, well, if you go sign up five people, then you get the retirement bonus. Right? He's saying, when you come into relationship with him, God will abide with you, will tabernacle with you, will live in you. And that's going to change you so much that you're going to behave like Jesus. And what did Jesus do? Love. Love. Who? Everybody. Everybody. Remember John 3, 16? For God's love the world, right? Yeah. He chased Pharisees. He chased prostitutes. He talked to tax collectors. He talked to rich people, right? Everybody. Right. When we have God in our heart, we get the heart of God. And we don't have time to go into all of it tonight, but that's one of the ideas behind sanctification, right? That, that when we are filled with the Holy Spirit, it changes what we want. And we go from wanting what the selfish wants to wanting what God wants. Yes. Prayer is a wonderful example. You pray differently when you have God in your heart. Yeah, and I think... The will of God is not a blanket, oh God, I want your will, but what you pray for specifically ends up becoming the will of God. Yeah. And it's not that you're making it the will of God. It is you're being led by the Spirit to pray in ways that leads you to the will of God. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 
So this is why we talk in the Church of the Nazarene about two different experiences. There's the, the first experience of being saved and the second experience of being sanctified. I know the language is clumsy, but coming to know Jesus and being completely filled with the Holy Spirit for most of us, it takes two steps. It takes two steps, yeah. But when we are filled with Jesus, we become like Jesus. And we come to love what Jesus loves. And when we're filled with him, and he says, we, right? You're getting the Father, the Son, the Spirit, the whole shebang. The whole thing, right? No, nothing held back. You're not only not an orphan, you are a full child of God. And you will be taught everything and reminded of everything. Why? Let's pick on Peter. Why does Peter need to be taught everything and reminded of everything? He's hard-headed. Hard and he's got a sermon to preach. Same as us, right? We're hard-headed, we're fearful, we're anxious, we're easily distracted. We need our paraclete. I don't want to rush it, so I'm going to leave 27 to 29 for, for next week. And we'll talk about peace running into 15. This is kind of my, one of my regular reminders that the chapter and verse separations were not there in the early text. And so they're kind of artificial divisions. Really, this whole section, it's kind of like the Sermon on the Mount is all one thing, even though it's three chapters. This is all one discourse, even though it's broken up into chapters. So... Um, we'll get into this next week, but basically, as a little spoiler, this peace that we receive, it's a gift the world cannot give. It's a gift that comes from God. But it's not just for you, right? When we receive God's peace, God's shalom, we become, uh, you know, Paul uses words like ambassador, but I like the idea of like an outpost or a part of the kingdom. We become the kingdom of God breaking through into the world, each one of us. So we can talk about we're all priests. Or we're, it's, it's, I think the light in the dark is maybe a good way to do it, to say, right? You, the peace, the spirit in you becomes a light in the dark. And when you're walking around, everybody's saying, hey, there's light, right? And then when they touch that, they become light, like when we do the candles on Christmas Eve. Right? When my candle lights your candle, does mine get less bright? No. no. It starts with the Christ candle, and then it's all lit. And suddenly the dark room becomes lit up. That's what Jesus is saying. When you follow, when you obey, when you live in this, it's not just because it benefits you. It's so that it can benefit everyone. And this has been the point all along. Back to the Abrahamic covenant. I will bless you so that the whole world will be blessed through you. This has always been God's plan. It was God's plan with Adam and Eve before the fall, right? That it is very good, and you're stewards, and a garden, and the whole world will be blessed, right? We messed it up, but God made sure that his promise is kept. That we, created in his image, his image bearers, are going to bring the kingdom to every corner of creation. I think he probably did. I think that patient read Dostoevsky. <laughs> uh, he's a Dostoevsky's a, a Russian author, and if you want to get moody, read Russians. Um, but uh, I'm going to condense this real quick. Dostoevsky wrote this, this collection called The Brothers Karamazov, and there's one part of the book, and this really made my mood when I read it the first time. It messed me up bad. It's these three brothers, they've come back together for their father's funeral. Mm -hmm. They're reading the newspaper before the funeral. And they're reading this story about a little girl who died. She was being abused by her family and she was punished by getting locked in the outhouse. And they left her in the outhouse overnight and she froze to death. Now granted, this is fiction, but this stuff happens, right? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what one of the brothers asks. If you were God and you knew that by making the world, this little girl would die in that way, would you do it? So the question is the goodness of God. The question is the goodness of God. Right. Is God, God told? But that's, this life is not all that there is. Right. 
There's eternal light. Right now we see through a mirror darkly. Right. And the accuser wants us to look at the pain and at the hurt and turn our back on God. Right? God, allow it. Right. God right. So that question is one that is asked often in lots of different ways. There's a whole branch of theology about it called theodicy. But that question is a big part of why we need the truth revealed to us through the Spirit. Because we have a world and we have a deceiver who is trying to whisper, oh no, God is not actually good. Are we going to trust that God really is good and God really loves us? That's really the question. When Jesus is saying, obey my commands, what he really means is, are you going to abide in a loving relationship with me and trust me? And trust is required when things outside don't always look right. Please. Well, a couple times it says, when you keep or obey my commandments, well, the second time it says, it's been just translated as commandments, it says my word. So you can, there's ways to, yeah. you know. That's there's the a lot of wordplay, word right? It could be everything he ever said. Yeah. Because remember the transfiguration where God speaks from heaven and he's like, mm-hmm. hey, knuckleheads, this is my son. Do what he says. Right? That's a pretty close translation, right? The knucklehead part I added, but the, this is my son. Listen to him. Mary's one of our prime examples of faith because of that, right? She pondered these things in her heart, and her response was, let it be, just as you have said. I don't understand it. She says, how could this be? I don't get it, but let it be, just as God has said. And she said, I'm the servant of the Lord. Amen. So, and she used the word slave. I'm yeah. a slave of the Lord. Which is the word Paul uses when Paul says he's a servant. He's, he's a bond servant, and when he calls Jesus Lord, he's saying master. Yeah, I'm sold to you. I give myself to you as a, like I'm your slave. I'm yours. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that kind of surrender is hard. And that's the kind of surrender the disciples are being called to. But remember, it's, we're not left as orphans, right? We're not grist for the mill. We're children of the king. As it says in the Bible that in the New Testament that God will even remind us what we read in the Bible mm-hmm. and the word we heard, but then we need to make testimony. Yeah. And not to worry about what we were going to say to answer yeah. why it is we have this hope. Yeah. And we see that, right? Like with Stephen. Mm-hmm. He's a great example of it. Yeah. Or Paul, or Peter. <laughs> There's lots of examples, but but yeah, yeah. So this is good stuff. I don't want to leave stuff out. So we'll pause here. And we'll pick up here next week. And uh, thank you guys for a great conversation. Thank you, Pastor, for your insights into Greek. I appreciate it. Um, It's nice when we can lift each other up. We all bring different things to the table, right? So Let's uh, close in prayer. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for a chance to study your word, Father. Thank you for the joy of reading what your son said. And and not just looking at words on a page, but to speak it and to to hold it in our hearts and to to have it warm us and guide us. And it's a source of life, Father. Like, honey, (laughs) thank you, Father, for this gift. Thank you that we have the freedom and the privilege of gathering together openly and studying your word. And Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters around the world who do not have the gospel in their own language and are not able to freely gather. Father, thank you for this privilege. Please help us to abide. Help us to obey. Help us to be faithful. Help us to trust you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, good night, everybody online.